Schönen guten Abend, mein Name ist Jan Wagner und ich werde das Gespräch in der nächsten kommenden Stunde führen mit Margaret Edward. Die Unterhaltung wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Wer sie auf Deutsch später nachhören will, kann das wohl im Internet tun. My name is Jan Wagner and I'll be hosting the conversation, which is going to be in English only and will last about 60 minutes or a little bit more, depending on one, when Margaret Edward has to go to her next reading, which will start at, at 7.30. Um, it's probably unnecessary to introduce Margaret Edward to you, um, as you'll all be familiar with her work, but I'd like to point to some details, perhaps, before we start uh, talking. Um, details about her career as a poet. Um, her first collection was published in 1961 uh, called Double Persephone, um, Die Doppelte Persephone, or Die Zweifache Persephone, and since then she's published almost 20 collections to date, um, starting in 61 and then quickly following up with more collections in the 60s and 70s, sometimes even one each year in the end of the 60s, um, with such beautiful titles like uh, Two-Headed Poems or um, the Journals of Susan Moody. In the 80s, another collection, Interlunar, and then uh, in 1995, a wonderful book called um, Morning in the Burned House, which looks like that. Um, there was, a couple of years ago, a broad German selection of Margaret Edwards' poems, uh, published by Berlin Verlag. Uh, it's this giant orange book, a very heavy book indeed, and it's, uh, it's called Die Füchsin. Um, it collects poems from almost all collections. The, 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 the debut is not included, in fact, but almost all other books are in there. And each book is um, translated or had, has been translated by uh, a different German poet. So that came out a couple of years ago. And, um, and now, or in Canada two years ago, a new collection called Dearly uh, was published. Uh, this is also um, due to come out in German next month. Um, so a huge poetical world and, of course, Margaret Edward writes novels as well. <laughs> so would you please welcome Margaret Edward once more to Berlin and give a warm round of applause to her. to talk like this, to, to bend over leftward, to the left, but um, let me um, perhaps start by telling you there was a great pleasure to translate your poems um, two times already, um, because I did this morning in the Burnt House book uh, as well as dearly, and it was uh, great fun to translate your poems. Well, I'm happy to hear that, yeah. because translating is very, very hard, and possibly the hardest thing, and translating poetry is much harder than translating a murder mystery, <laughs> because there is no plot, <laughs> usually. Yeah. yeah, so it is very hard, and I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did enjoy it because the poems, of course, uh, well, are lovely in itself, or in themselves. They are, well, could you say, embracing the reader while not, while not uh, um, letting him down intellectually. And uh, what appears as free verse poetry uh, I'm sure you would agree that there is no such thing as free verse in poetry, as every verse is not free in a poem, but very settled and, and just as it has to be. Yes, well, it's, 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 it's free from the point of view of the old English scheme of end rhymes and stanzas, but the pattern is usually a pattern of syllables. So the sounds within words are what forms the pattern. But, and, and that's why it's so hard to translate, because how do you make an equivalent in another language? And you, you can't do a literal translation, because that often comes out very strangely in, indeed. Yeah. Well, perhaps free verse poetry is the hardest to translate of all of them, just like Borges, the Argentine poet, said there's no such thing to, harder to write than a free verse or so-called free verse poem. But what I, what I loved was also that uh, why they are embracing and really open all their doors to the reader and to the translator as well. Um, they are a wonderful uh, invitation to, to play as well. Um, 
they obviously you do like rhyme as well. There are, there are rhymes in the poems, um, um, song-like qualities. Uh, you know, the, dare to the, dead, the songs of dead sisters, for example, you, you work with rhyme elsewhere as well. And they seem to be fond of puns and word plays as well. And Unfortunately for the <laughs> translator. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you, in one poem it says, um, uh, so hard to translate the smallest details of flowers. This is a stamen, nothing to do with men. This is a pistol, nothing to do with guns. And then you go, it's the smallest details that foil translators and kindly add, and myself, um, <laughs> uh, to trying to describe. But, mm. uh, but that was the great fun of it, too. Um, the, the, the fact that you uh, like, like puns, that, that you also are interested in the uh, etymology of words. Sometimes you use out or seemingly outdated words and, and, uh, and play with them and, and see what's in them. And that's, it is challenging, really. If you, in the title poem, Dearly, uh, there's this lovely play with, um, it, it uses words like reft and asunder. Uh, and what can you do in German? Well, you can do, <laughs> you can do something. Reft would be like bar, bar aller Dinge and asunder uh, and zwei, but mm -hmm. but uh, but that's not all because you 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 dig into the word asunder and and uh, see this if I'm not mistaken the minor sunset which comes later you see the sun in asunder, so the word and zwei suddenly turns into a minor sunset, and uh, and so what do you do in German? But that's that's interesting and also uh, as I said an invitation to play and to try to find something. Uh, uh, to do with it, which is possible after all. Um, so you, you could, uh, uh, well, what I did was um, I tried to walk or to go from a sunder and a sunset to zwei and zwi and zwillig and zwielicht, which zwillig would be a, 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 a rather, rather harsh uh, cloth and zwielicht, the twilight. So you can move into the same direction, but you have to take your liberties. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a translation conference in, in France. So it was in Paris. And the man running it was actually from Quebec. I think only a person from Quebec would have such a mad idea. Uh, so the Anglophone poets were all sent poems by the Francophone poets, and the Francophone poets were sent poems by the Anglophone poets. And we were, we were each supposed to translate the other one's poems. But some people didn't speak French. <laughs> and other people didn't speak English. <laughs> so we had these translations. And then we, we all got together. And we read the original. And then we read the various translations. And the, there were some very exact translations by people who did speak the other language. And there were some very surreal translations by people who didn't speak <laughs> the other language. But often these surreal translations were better poems in the, po in the language of translation. They, 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 they didn't say what the poem said, but they were very interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there were no intermediators, no word-for-word oh, word yes. translators. Then, then we had, because it was France, we, we then right. had a sort of um, word tasting to which the general public was invited. And I said, nobody's going to come to this, hmm. really. Uh, but it was full. And uh, each audience member had their own opinions, hmm. which they expressed about sure. the choice of this word or, on the other hand, that word. And this went on for quite a long time. I was, I was amazed uh, that it held the attention, but so it was, because these were people who were passionate about language. So it was like a wine tasting only with, with poems. Yeah. Well, um, you, you, can, you can go on endlessly talking about translations and, and you, you will always and find some better or equally good or bad solution. Or peculiar. Um, <laughs> or a peculiar, or peculiar solution. Yes, indeed. Yes. There are these, these, uh, these gatherings in Germany as well where, you, uh, where they invite six poets from one language and six from another. Do they? They do, and, and, and it's good fun. And as you said, the results are astonishing and sometimes, uh, uh, as you said, happens that, the, that people who don't speak the language at all produce a, a very fine poem, very close to the original version. Sometimes I think it's, it's really due to the fact that they do not speak the language because they are not, they're not feeling bound to hold true to the, to the semantical. 
Uh, well, the these days, meaning. of course, we have Google Translate. True. And that can give you some very odd results. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't tried, I haven't tried uh, uh, playing your poems through Google Translate, but, uh, but I'm sure that would have been fun as well. But, um, no, but the fact that you don't stick to the, that you kind of take your liberties and you don't stick to the original, uh, the strict sense the of the literal, original yes. makes it, may, may make it a better poem in your own language. And I think that is often true because sometimes literal translations are just really impossible. Yeah. And sometimes the word doesn't exist. Uh, so you have to use maybe a sentence, a phrase, uh, an explanation of some kind because the, there isn't one word that is the same as that word. And that's why sometimes you will find um, your books in translation into, for instance, Japanese, are much thicker <laughs> than they are in yeah. English because those words don't exist. And, and similarly, translating from Japanese, they have single words that, that simply don't exist in, in English. So they have one word that means the color of silk bleached on snow. Mm. That is wonderful yes. and hard to translate. So and, uh, colors yes. and tastes. Yes. They have a lot of words for colors and tastes that, that don't exist in one word form in English and probably not in German mm. either. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, you have to, it's the, the beautiful paradox of translating poetry to me is that you have to, uh, you, I think you can stay truthful to the original poem. The, the, um, to I think the spirit to of To the it. spirit and yes. also to the sense and the form if you're lucky, M maybe mm. to all uh, a little bit, but sometimes you have to take your liberties and have to be, have to be untruthful in order to stay truthful. And that's the, the beauty about it, that you sometimes you know, make a full circle and, and knock on the back door to re-enter the original poem and saying, this is it. And that sometimes happens and, and this is, that is beautiful and uh, it occurred several times in these poems as well. Uh, when I translated your poems. I look forward to reading your translations. And you do speak German. <laughs> Ein bisschen, ja. Ein bisschen, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I, I can read it much better than I can speak it natürlich. Yeah. It's always like that. Well, and you were kind enough, and I have to thank you for that as well, to answer some questions in advance. I sent you a letter, mm -hmm. and, you, and you actually got back and, and answered these questions. I, I always do that if I, if I mm -hmm. can uh, contact the poet I'm translating. I, I, I'm fond of sending a letter to answer some questions because, to be frank, there are words you don't understand properly if you're not a native speaker. There are innuendos and echoes of other poems, of, of cultural historical exactly. layers you just yes. don't understand. And more often than not, it has happened to me that I asked a seemingly silly question and the answer was very deep and very helpful and, and made the German poem, and it's supposed to be a poem in the, in, in the end, the translation should be a poem in itself, uh, it helped make this translation a lot, a lot better. So I'm, I was glad that you answered those questions. I'm glad too. <laughs> Does it happen often to you? I mean, you, you were translated in many languages, and I'm sure uh, that wasn't the first uh, letter with the questions you received. Are you delighted to receive those, uh, those uh, questions, or are you, are you rather uh, taken aback? No, I would much rather have a person ask the questions if they need to. Um, but sometimes you think, if they've asked this question, what else have they not understood <laughs> without, without knowing that they didn't yeah. understand it? Yeah. Um, so for instance, and quite some time ago, I got a question from a Chinese translator saying, saying, what is this granola? We do not know what this granola is. And then they said, what is this smile button? So you know the smiley face with the eyes and right. the mouth. He yes. said, so we know what button is, we know what smile is, but what is smile button? <laughs> this is a little hard to describe. Isn't you, it? Yeah, I well, wonder I what your answer drew a picture. would be like. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, but but like still, it's, it's better to receive, uh, I think it's always a bad sign if there are no questions at all, isn't it? I, I think it makes you rather nervous, yes. Doesn't it? Yes. I remember a, f a friend of mine, a Scottish poet, um, 
received an invitation to, to Lisbon and Portugal to, to read his poems there, and, when he, and only then learned that he had been translated into Portuguese. Mm. There weren't any questions in advance whatsoever. So he did accept the invitation and went to Lisbon and, and, and read his poetry on stage. There's one lovely poem where he describes uh, a carpet and those creatures living underneath carpets, which are called Silberfischchen in German, and Silberfisch in yeah, English. Yeah. And, and he uh, read this poem, and only reading that poem on stage in Lisbon and, and listening to his translator uh, reading the poem, he learned that uh, the translator had translated Silverfish with sardines. No. And uh, <laughs> that was a problem, obviously. Well, I, I, it makes it very interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Were these uh, sardines alive or dead? <laughs> we don't know. It, it gave the whole poem a fatal turn into the, into the kitchen, uh, <laughs> into the, the cuisine world. And, uh, but, um, but maybe a good example for what can happen if you don't ask questions. Uh, uh, yes, a very good example. Yeah. Oh, of course. But. Uh, I, I gather from what you're saying that you wouldn't you wouldn't subscribe to Frost's famous saying. <laughs> <laughs> that you wouldn't subscribe to Frost's famous saying that, that poetry is what's, what's lost in translation. You have had some good experiences uh, being oh, yes. translated. Yes, they had a, a translation. Um, what would you call it? A conference, a, a gathering. Yes in uh, Banff in Canada, which is this place in the mountains of Alberta. And they had translators from all over uh, the place. And then they would invite the author so that the translators from many different countries yeah. could ask questions. And uh, that was really interesting because they asked different questions. And one of them said, is this an old word, a new word, it is, is it a vulgar word, or is it a word you made up yourself? <laughs> so I think these are good, good questions yeah. if you don't know what, because otherwise you can't give the flavor of that word. And it's lovely to compare the solutions of all those different, uh, um, different translators of all kinds of languages. Yes, right. and there are problems that come up. For instance, yeah. in, in Finnish, they were translating a novel and they said, we don't have a he or a she. Hmm. So could you please put a skirt or a, you know, a tie or something like that <laughs> so in the first page so we know what kind of person we're talking about. Right. And they don't have a word for uncle or aunt. They have specific words for uh, mother's brother, mother's sister, father's brother, father's sister. Those are all four different words. Um, so it, it causes them to ask questions because they can't translate it unless they know the family relationship of that person. Huh. And uh, you know about the Japanese business cards. They present the business card. It's not your name they're looking at. They're looking at your rank, whether the person is higher than them, the same as them, lower than them, because that will affect um, how you say hello. <laughs> and you, you actually can't say anything yeah. unless you know that. Hmm. Yeah, so that is the secret of the presentation of the business card. I did not know that, but we'll keep mm. it in mind. Well, keep it in mind. If, if I ever yes. in yeah. the situation to, to, so to why you my need business to card take this yes. card with yeah. you so that people will be able to say yeah. hello to you. Mm. <laughs> but what, is, what you're telling us about the Finnish language is beautiful and, and makes me think that, uh, that uh, uh, it's all the less true that poetry is what's lost in translation and that it's too seldom stressed um, what is to be gained in translation as well because all those peculiarities of a language may add to the original poem as well and may, may make things possible which were not possible in the original poem but may well add to the spirit of it. They may make things necessary yeah. in the translation <laughs> that were not necessary yeah. in the original. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Has, has it happened to you that you thought, I, I'm so happy that this translator into Chinese or into Finnish or Slovenian um, uh, um, could use this or that of his grammar or his, 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 his language because it, may, has it made my 
my poem a better poem or has added to it in a way that I could not have foreseen in, in, in English. That's a lovely thought. And it's not one that I had thought before this moment, but <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm thinking it now. Uh, so yes, that's a very hopeful thing to say yeah. about translation. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 hope, <laughs> I, I hope it is true, and it, it, uh, I'm sure it has happened before. Um, have you, we, um, you will read from Delhi soon, but, but uh, shall we, if you wish or, or, or want to briefly talk about your career as a poet, I hope you were not offended um, by my introduction, by introducing you merely as a poet and not mentioning a novel at all. But you did start publishing poetry exclusively, didn't you? For and, eight years you, you published here, here uh, collections are the of poetry. So this was in the 1960s in Canada when we barely had a publishing industry. Hmm. And why did we barely had a, have a publishing industry? Uh, there was an industry of cheap hardbacks in the 30s. But then what got invented? The paperback book. And the paperback book got invented in England with um, pocket books. No, it's the other way around, with penguins. And in the United States with pocket books. But it meant that there were no um, cheap paperback books in Canada except those that were imported. Mm. This is when you could buy them in, in pharmacies with, you know, lurid covers. I think a lot of people read classics that way. So and it would bought be, them in pharmacies. Of course. But it's beautiful. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, war, war and Peace, Blonde in a Negligee. I think, <laughs> okay. This is going to be really sexy. <laughs> but <laughs> no, poetry, no poetry um, books in no, pharmacies. But that no, would been, no. So, yeah. so publishing a novel in Canada, a novel in Canada, was rather hard at that time. Because the way the industry worked in other countries was you would have this hardback, and then you would have a big paperback sale. Uh, but that couldn't happen in, in Canada, so it was very difficult mm. because you couldn't publish a novel in Canada unless you had a partner in the United Kingdom or in America. And Canadians at that time were being told, well, Canada doesn't really exist, it doesn't have any... <laughs> You know, it doesn't have any idea of itself. And, and then you would try to publish a novel and they would say, this is too Canadian. <laughs> so this was a contradiction in, in terms. So a lot of young writers went into poetry. And this was a time when you had coffee house readings. Hmm. So like City Lights and in San Francisco, and what you needed was a falling down warehouse, you needed some um, little tables, you needed some checkered tablecloths, you needed a Chianti bottle with a candle in it, <laughs> and you needed a stand-up mic. And that is where I started reading poetry when I was 20 years old. And um, it was a trial by fire because this falling down warehouse had the first espresso machine <laughs> that anyone had ever seen in Canada. It was like... <laughs> and it was worshipped like an idol. Uh, <laughs> and it also had a washroom, the door of which opened onto the room where you were reading. <laughs> so you would be reading your most heartfelt serious verse, and someone would turn on the espresso machine, <laughs> or they would flush the toilet. So once you've done that, you're ready for anything. Sure. Yes. <laughs> so then we started... Um, <laughs> I can do this. Um, <laughs> then we started um, our own publishing companies. And uh, I was part of one of those in the 60s, and we were all doing everything. So we were um, reading each other's manuscripts, we were offering editorial opinions, we were um, publishing the books, we were designing the covers, and we were going around at night with posters and stapling them up Lovely. Uh, on telephone poles and 
and uh, wooden walls. Mm. We were doing all of that. Uh, so that is, uh, mostly it was poetry that we were doing. We started with poetry, but then we had to publish other books to support the poetry, as one does. So unless you sing and play the guitar, like Leonard Cohen, you're not going to make a lot of money or any money out of, right. out of poetry. So we were thinking of other things to publish, and we published the first book on venereal disease. It was called VD. In order, in order to be able to publish poetry. In, no, in order to be able to publish poetry, yeah. that's true. That's, that's what a we were doing. Yes. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we got as far as warts. Uh, but we, <laughs> we did not yet have any AIDS. Well, warts and words goes, go together nicely, of course. Mm, yeah. You behave yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we did that, and um, we had a, a book on, on law, which was sort of how to write your own will and things like that. Right. So we were selling these as well as the poetry books. Yeah. That uh, gives you some deep insights into the publishing business. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but that means that, you, that at the time you were writing prose already. It, it wasn't I was that already you writing prose. I was already, um, indeed, it was just harder to get it published in Canada. Hmm. And when I finally did have my first novel appear in 1969, which had been written in 1964 or 5, uh, that could only happen because the publisher got a partner in the UK and a partner in, in the United States. Mm. Other, otherwise, it was just too... It was thought that there wasn't a Canad enough Canadian readers to make this financially viable. But poetry was cheap, and uh, a lot of us started by actually publishing our own books in things like The Cellar. Hmm. So that first book that you mentioned was, was hand-set by me on a flatbed press, hmm. believe it or not. Hmm. So I can tell you how to hand-set, you have to do it backwards. Um, and we didn't have enough A's. so. <laughs> We would handset one poem and print it off, and then we would have to disassemble all of that and set the next one. It was a very limited edition. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that would be also a very interesting form of restriction while writing the poems, to, to use as, as, as little A's as possible. Uh, I was not yet that advanced. Right. I, think, <laughs> right. I think there's a French novelist who's written a whole novel exactly. without any so A's, but yes. I wasn't yes. thinking about that. I was just thinking, yeah. no A's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, in double Persephone, in the title, at least, you didn't need any A's. I uh, didn't, yeah. no, yeah, yeah, that was lucky. So, yeah. yes. but, um, but you already uh, ring... Uh, um, or bring in a subject matter which, which is, found in, you know, is to be found in Daly as well, the, the, the myth, uh, the myth, myth, mythical figure. You, you yes, chose I've, always, I've always been interested in the Greek underworld. Yeah. And, uh, and for, for a debut collection, Persephone, of course, that goes way back to, to Ovid and, and those great masters. A double Persephone, I assume, because she spends half a year exactly. in, in, in hell and one in summer. No, we don't call it hell. Oh. And, and uh, well, we in the underworld and half the time. Life with her uh, husband. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the other half. Yeah, they've in done the a, a brilliant musical in, in New York called Hades Town, which is right. exactly the same myth, except it's the Orpheus uh, myth. Uh, where he descends in, in search of his vanished uh, wife. Hmm. Uh, anyway, it's quite brilliant. If you, of course, COVID interrupted it, but they, they're, they've brought it back. It's really good. Just saying, I'm yeah. not the only. <laughs> I'm not the only person to have to have drawn on this hmm. body of mythology. In fact, it was sort of normal in the 18th century to use these myths as operas and things like that. Hmm. In, in one of your essays, you described that you wrote your first poem while crossing some football field. And it I just, know. Uh, so it happened to you. Uh, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, it's a good story. 
Uh, and sort of true, like such stories, the origin myths, you know, people are always saying things, well, where do you get your inspiration? And of course, you don't really know, but you have to make something up, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, I think Lamartine, the French poet, described himself riding on a wood, uh, through a wood on a horse uh, when the, with a full moon shining, and then uh, some sonnet came into his mind. Perfect. I like the football field a lot yeah. better. At I least he say. didn't fall off the horse. He did, it was I good. Think he did oh, not. He did, no, or no. he didn't. He didn't, but no. They, they, he did not, but they, they discovered after his death, I think, uh, drawers full of notes. Of um, course, yes. Um, <laughs> um, so he didn't just uh, receive the sonnet from it, some uh, you know, exterior force, but, but uh, no. actually spent some time scribbling. Yes, well, this was when I was in high school, and I did have, and this is true, uh, the football field is sort of true. Um, I did have an English teacher who read one of my early poems and said, I can't understand this at all, dear, so it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> Modern criticism, love it. Uh, yeah, it's like but, that. But what do you think if you look back on your, on your old poems? Um, I mean, in, the, in the preface, or there's, in, the, in Dearly, there's a, it's not a preface, it's a letter to the reader. Dear, dear reader, you say, and then you yes. point out um, what, you, what, what topics you discuss in Dearly, and you also talk about your writing technique. And you say that it hasn't changed a lot since your no. beginnings, that you still write by hand, and then you type the poems, and uh, there you go. That's, that's a yes. And then you type the poems on the computer or a typewriter, actually? It's a computer now. Yeah. Um, my problem is that my handwriting, as you can see from the flyleaf of this book, is sometimes rather hard to read, yeah. even for me. <laughs> So if I've written it in uh, handwriting and then go back to it to type it, there have been moments when I haven't been able to decipher what I yeah. have written. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that you say that because I, I've got the same, <laughs> the same problem. I, I, I do write by hand and I have a, I've what we call in German a Sauklaue, a terrible handwriting. And uh, I have to decipher my own notes. But the beautiful thing for me is that uh, what I finally decipher is a lot better than I what, what I wrote down originally. How so, do so you the, know? Oh, well, <laughs> I got the feeling. I think I know, I think I know you, because of the pleasant surprise I feel. Oh, good. It's just this, this, this kind of surprise of discovering something in your own handwriting which you didn't know was there. And yes, it's a, a exactly. Moment of beauty. And, it, and it wasn't there, but... <laughs> But now, but, but, but now, now it is. is. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. I so, like those surprises. Yeah. And yeah. anyway, one doesn't have a choice because you can't actually read that word anyway. Yeah, that's right. So it's nice to believe this must be better. <laughs> it must be. I think we, we um, shall continue chatting uh, after the reading, but we should uh, uh, welcome uh, Hildegard Schmal, uh, who will read the German translations of four poems. Uh, but if she's still there, she is. Hello. So, hello. 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 <laughs> it works. Yes. It works? Is your ears okay? I hope. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to read the English one, and Hildegard is going to read Auf Deutsch. <laughs> so I will read this poem called Late Poems, which is from Dearly, and the translation that Hildegard is going to read is by Jan Wagner. So triple threat. <laughs> <laughs> late Poems. These are the late poems. Most poems are late, of course, too late, like a letter sent by a sailor that arrives after he's drowned. Too late to be of help, such letters, and late poems are similar. They arrive as if through water. Whatever it was has happened, the battle, the sunny day, the moonlit slipping into lust, the farewell kissed. The poem washes ashore like flotsam. Or late as in late for supper, all the words cold or eaten. 
scoundrel plight and vanquished, or linger, bide a while, forsaken, wept, forlorn, love and joy even, thrice gnawed songs, rusted spells, worn choruses. It's late, it's very late, too late for dancing. Still, sing what you can, turn up the light, sing on, sing on. Späte Gedichte. Dies sind die späten Gedichte. Die meisten Gedichte sind späte, versteht sich. Zu spät, wie der Brief eines Seemanns, der eintrifft, nachdem er ertrunken ist. Zu spät solche Briefe, um hilfreich zu sein. Und mit späten Gedichten ist es ähnlich. Sie werden wie durch Wasser gereicht. Was es auch war, es ist längst passiert. Die Schlacht, der sonnige Tag, das Mondbeschienene hinabgleiten in die Lust, der Abschiedskuss. Das Gedicht wird wie Treibgut ans Ufer gespült oder spät wie in zu spät zum Abendbrot und alle Wörter längst kalt oder gegessen. Halunke, Unbill, bezwungen oder verharren, weilen, flugs, verlassen, elend, tränenblind. Sogar Liebe und Freude, dreifach zernagte Lieder, eingerostete Formeln, verschlissene Refrains. Es ist spät, allzu spät, zu spät zum Tanzen und doch sing, was du nur kannst. Dreh die Lichter auf, sing weiter, sing weiter. Short Takes on Wolves. One, a wolf in pain admits nothing. His dinner bit him. It was a miscalculation, and now it will be a disaster. You can't go far with a ripped foot. Among wolves, no doctors. Two, a wolf is courteous up to a point. You have to watch their ears. Forward, they're willing to listen. Back, you've bored them. Three, sit in the dark, keep quiet. Don't light that cigarette or smear on the black fly goo. It's not a speed dating venue. It's not a zoo. You want to see the wolf or demand your money back. But the wolf doesn't want to see you. Four, wolf nightmares involve cars, long needles, iron muzzles, cramped cages with hard bars, creatures who smell like you. Wolf happy dreams, on the other hand, are of endless taiga, dens dug under stones, limping and stupid caribou, their tender bones. Kurze Szenen mit Wölfen. Eins, der Wolf, der Schmerzen hat, wird sich nichts anmerken lassen. Sein Abendessen hat ihn gebissen. Es war eine Fehlkalkulation, die nun zur Katastrophe führt. Man kommt nicht weit mit eingerissenem Fuß. Unter Wölfen keine Ärzte. Zwei, ein Wolf ist bis zu einem gewissen Punkt höflich. Man muss ihre Ohren beobachten. Nach vorn gerichtet, sie hören dir zu. Nach hinten angelegt, du hast sie gelangweilt. Drei, sitze im Dunkeln, sei still, zünde nicht die Zigarette an oder schmier dich mit Kriebelmückenzeugs ein. Es ist kein Speed-Dating-Treff, es ist kein Zoo. Du willst den Wolf sehen oder dein Geld zurück. Aber der Wolf will dich nicht sehen. 
4. In Albträumen von Wölfen kommen Autos vor. Lange Nadeln, eiserne Maulkörbe, überfüllte Käfige mit harten Stangen und Geschöpfen, die wie du selbst riechen. Glückliche Wolfsträume hingegen handeln von endloser Taiga, unter Steinen gegrabenen Höhlen, humpelnden und dummen Karibus, ihren zarten Knochen. Feather. One by handfuls the feathers fell, wind shear, sun bleach, owl war, some killer with a shotgun, who can tell? But I found them here on the quasi lawn, I don't know whose torn skin. Calligraphy of wrecked wings, remains of a god that melted too near the moon. A high flyer once, as we all were. Every life is a failure at the last hour, the hour of dried blood. But nothing, we like to think, is wasted. So I picked up one plume from the slaughter, sharpened and split the quill, hunted for ink, and drew this poem with you, dead bird, with your spent flight, with your fading panic, with your eye spiraling down, with your night. Feder. Handvoll um Handvoll fielen die Federn. Scherwind, Sonnenbleiche, Eulenkrieg, irgendein Mörder mit Schrotflinte, wer weiß. Aber ich habe sie hier auf diesem beinahe Rasen gefunden. Zerfetzte Haut von irgendwem, Kalligrafie zerstörter Flügel, Überreste eines Gottes, der schmolz, als er dem Mond zu nahe kam. Vormals ein Höhenflieger, wie wir alle. Jedes Leben ist Scheitern, sobald die letzte Stunde schlägt, die Stunde getrockneten Blutes. Doch nichts, zumindest glauben wir das, ist vergebens. Also entnahm ich dem Gemetzel eine Feder, spitzte sie an und spaltete den Kiel, besorgte ein Tintenfass. Und so habe ich dieses Gedicht mit dir, toter Vogel, zu deinem Flug zu Papier gebracht, mit deiner schwindenden Panik, mit dem Trudelsturz deiner Augen, mit deiner Nacht. And the fourth poem, Blackberries. In the early morning, an old woman is picking blackberries in the shade. It will be too hot later, but right now there's dew. Some berries fall, those are for squirrels. Some are unripe, reserved for bears. Some go into the metal bowl. Those are for you, so you may taste them just for a moment. That's good times, one little sweetness after another, then quickly gone. Once this old woman I'm conjuring up for you would have been my grandmother. Today, it's me. Years from now, it might be you if you're quite lucky. The hands reaching in among the leaves and spines were once my mother's. I've passed them on. Decades ahead, you'll study your own temporary hands, and you'll remember. Don't cry. This is what happens. Look, the steel bowl is almost full, enough for all of us. 
The blackberries gleam like glass, like the glass ornaments we hang on trees in December to remind ourselves to be grateful for snow. Some berries occur in sun, but they are smaller. It's as I always told you, the best ones grow in shadow. Brombeeren. Am frühen Morgen pflückt eine alte Frau im Schatten Brombeeren. Später wird es zu heiß sein, aber noch liegt Tau. Einige Beeren fallen herab, die sind für die Eichhörnchen. Einige sind unreif, die gehören den Schwarzbeeren. Einige kommen in die Metallschüssel. Diese sind für dich, du darfst von ihnen kosten, nur einen Augenblick lang. So ist es mit den guten Zeiten, ein Tück Süße nach dem anderen und dann rasch vorbei. Früher einmal wäre diese Alte, die ich vor dir erscheinen lasse, meine Großmutter gewesen. Heute bin ich es. In vielen Jahren wirst vielleicht du es sein, wenn du ein bisschen Glück hast. Die Hände, die zwischen Blättern und Stacheln hineingreifen, waren einmal die meiner Mutter. Ich habe sie weitergegeben. In ein paar Jahrzehnten wirst du deine eigenen flüchtigen Hände betrachten und dich erinnern. Weine nicht. So geschieht es eben. Schau, die Stahlschüssel ist fast voll, genug für uns alle. Die Brombeeren schimmern wie Glas, wie der Glasschmuck, der im Dezember in die Bäume gehängt wird, als Mahnung, dankbar für den Schnee zu sein. Es gibt Beeren, die in der Sonne gedeihen, aber die sind kleiner. Es ist so, wie ich dir immer gesagt habe, die Besten wachsen im Schatten. If, as you wish. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Stay here. Okay. No? <laughs> it's, it's, it's ten more minutes if you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Hildegard Schmal and Margaret Edel, for reading those four plus four poems, uh, which give an idea of, of the broad um, range of subject matters in that book, mm. dearly, um, which contains also. Uh, poems about aliens, about werewolves, about uh, snails, mm -hmm. and, and uh, maybe uh, the overarching theme of loss and age and, and, uh, and departure. Um, uh, the, the end of Blackberry seems to hint at that as well, that grief is, a, is a, an underlying uh, you get strain a, you get old. in the whole book. <laughs> Pardon me? You get old. <laughs> you will too, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. Thanks for all. So uh, I noticed that you said black bears. Yes. You translated black bears. So did you have to specify the kind of bear because otherwise it, people would have thought it was some different bear? Um, yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, what yeah. would they have thought? I don't know. You don't know. But uh, no, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't guess. Yes, but there are specific words for. Uh, so it wasn't a snow bear, for instance. Uh, no. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, you picked, um, amongst others, the, the first and, and the last poem of the book. Uh, um, um, late poems is the, 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 uh, the first. Um, first poem, and Blackberries, it ends with Blackberries. It doesn't end with the title poem. I think it's beautiful that you picked the, uh, the Blackberry poem as the last poem, which is one of two lovely Blackberry poems I know. Uh, the, the other one being Seamus Heaney's Blackberry Picking, which is a wonderful poem as well. 
But um, why did you, how, how do poems fall into place after writing all those single poems uh, over the years, over, well, 20 years almost, I assume? How, how, do, how do they turn to, to be a whole? Uh, um, how do they, how do they turn, turn into a collection? Book. Yes. yes. Um, well, I don't think there's any big secret. Um, so you lay them all out on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and then you kneel down and then sort out what, what way, yeah, what well, makes you, sense. You arrange them this way and that way. So and that means uh, you found, uh, uh, at the very end, you found blackberries under some chair and thought, oh, this poem uh, uh, I've also got left. And, uh, no, no, not quite like that. Yeah. So it's more like um, arranging a yes. pack of cards. Yeah, along motifs and, and, and themes. And, well, uh, it's going to be quite different depending um, how you arrange them. Hmm. So you probably know this writer called Pessoa, who wrote a book called The Book of Disquiet, but it, it's not really a book. It was a collection of different sections that he left in a trunk and said, arrange these any way you want. The legendary trunk, which uh, still offers The legendary offers new trunk. Yes. Um, so it's, it's going to be different depending what you put at the front and what you put at the back and what you put in the middle. And that can take some time. And then you have to decide, am I just going to put them all together in one long string, or am I going to divide them up into parts to give the reader a little bit of a pause? Uh, but it's very similar to uh, working with a, a, a novel that is com complex and has uh, more than one time um, stream. So it's going to be quite different depending on on how you begin it, mm. and also how you end it. And working with other people's novels sometimes, which I do, I say, this isn't the beginning. You should take this part, which is maybe page 15, and put that at the beginning. Mm. Because whatever you put at the beginning is like the door. The real door is the cover, but then there's a, an inner door. <laughs> And that will be the first page of the manuscript. And I assume uh, to pick uh, the, the late poems uh, was, an, was, an, was an easy choice because it does uh, immediately open up and, and it makes you uh, want to enter that, that I'm, room. I'm glad, that you've, image. I'm glad that it looks easy. Well, it, <laughs> maybe it wasn't an easy choice, but it, it looks like the perfect choice then to, to, oh, of, to start a book with. Um, Good. The late poems. <laughs> yes, this, I mean, it contains while, this yeah. lovely image of, of, the, of, this, of the drowned sailor and the mm. poems reach through water, uh, which is lovely, uh, and always arriving too late, which does make you think, doesn't it, uh, is, isn't the marvel of poems at the same time that they always seem to arrive just in time, no matter how old they are, that, that you can read... Um, Tu Fu, a poet from the Chinese Tang uh, area, Tang dynasty, uh, and, and suddenly you think this is specifically written for me yes, in this you, very you, moment. You do think that, uh, which is one of the magic things. And we were talking about poetry the other day, and I, I said, you will notice that at weddings and funerals, people don't usually read from novels. <laughs> <laughs> they usually cite a poem of some kind uh, if they are not playing a recording of Frank Sinatra singing my way. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, they, they are soothing, um, and they can be soothing poems, and, and, uh, and uh, you, um, you, you obviously write about topics which, uh, which um, um, are a burden to us all at the moment. You talk about uh, the, the birds are reappearing. You read the poem Feather, but mm -hmm. the poems are uh, the birds are appearing and reappearing all through the book. And you also talk about the uh, the loss of birds due to, well, due to human influence, of course. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a, a suite of a sequence of poems called uh, the, about the plasty scene. So you pick up very, um, uh, well. Things, up to date, things that uh, are making topics, us anxious, yes. Which I are think, making us anxious. Yes, and, and, I think uh, we write about things that make us anxious. Um, but um, what um, would be the... Uh, I'm thinking, of, of course, of the Ukraine war as well, because the, uh, the, uh, um, 
maybe you know some poets as well who who's just stopped writing altogether. Um, I, I heard from writers uh, um, here about younger writers who said they just could not write anymore after after February and stopped altogether. Did, did that thought ever occur to you that poetry does not make sense at all anymore because of the circumstances we live in? Um, I think that happens when you don't know what's going to happen next. I think that can have a paralyzing effect. Uh, but because I'm quite OLD, um, <laughs> 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 uh, when Donald Trump was elected and when I was in the United States, some younger people were saying, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. And I said, no, it's not, yeah. actually. <laughs> lots of worse things. And just wait. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I think it can happen to younger people, especially younger people from these times because... If they were born in, say, the late 80s or the 90s, they, they, apart from the meltdown of the financial system in 2008, they haven't had a real sort of horrible uh, crisis. Mm. Um, but now a lot of them, a lot of young kids under 20, they're, they're very worried about the climate, and, and rightfully so. Um, I, I don't know whether it's it's useful to be completely um, flattened by things and and totally depressed. I mean, I, I think I don't think that's um, what I would feel. Hmm. But but some people just are. They they just feel that way. But it never has happened to you before that you felt uh, it doesn't make sense anymore to write poetry at all. I, that's never happened to me, but I, I was from a get-over-yourself generation. Hmm. So, you know, roll up your sleeves, do what you need to do, hmm. get through it, more like that. Um, so we weren't, um, we really, in my family, you were just not allowed to complain. Hmm. <laughs> um, we could go on. I had more questions about your upbringing and, and your your uh, your beginnings. Um, um, you, in one of your essays, you mentioned your your parents and what they said about poetry, and and about your plans of becoming a poet and how difficult yeah, it was keen to on be. It, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, like the, any parents, they want they want you to have a job. You know, they want you to <laughs> sure. something that will actually. Um, make a living so that, so that you're not going to be living, living in their cellar forever. <laughs> yeah. But your father was a biologist, right? Or yes, he was a biologist, but that was a, a self-created uh, thing. He, he was very self-created. He was from a very backwoods, rural uh, location. Hmm. And um, I'm, I'm, he has a little thing that he wrote, which I found after he had died, uh, which was about how he became that biologist, which is an, an unusual story in itself, because it, it wasn't self-evident that that would ever happen. These were these were backwoods people without any electricity and and very 19th century way of living. So you didn't grow up with a huge library, and uh, you couldn't pick amongst the books, or could you? Where, where, well, by that time, well? of course, we had books, but but in my father's childhood, they had. They had um, the weekly newspaper, that was sort of it. Mm. Uh, but the weekly newspaper was very red <laughs> several times. And, and when you were starting uh, um, with your poems in the, in the 50s, uh, when after crossing well, that people, football... People uh, thought I was a lunatic, but um, they, they thought that poets in general were lunatics, and female poets in particular. <laughs> But it was okay for them to be lunatics because they weren't as important. <laughs> they could do their lunacy at home. But there must have been some role models uh, uh, when you were start, uh, starting out. Th there uh, weren't any role models except dead people. Uh, right. dead, dead people in other countries. I was, I was, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of Sylvia Plath, but she started basically writing I didn't around know the same time. Yeah, I did not know but about But people her like, like Elizabeth Bishop or Marianne Moore. Not no, yet. Not yet, right. No, we, yeah. this was high school in the 50s in Canada. So that would have been Tennyson, right? So overlooking all those decades, has that changed at all? It must have changed a lot since but then. But Emily Bronte, yes. another well, lunatic, 
Yeah, so it was okay to be a lunatic as long as you're a dead <laughs> lunatic in England. <laughs> <laughs> we have to come to uh, um, a close because there's another there's a reading at at, uh, at 7:30, um, and it's past six already. But um, we made the circle back to back to uh, your beginnings, and I would like to uh, finish by reading a, a lovely um, paragraph from one of your essays where you talk about your first reading tour, uh, um, and I thought it was astonishing. You talk about um, um, about um, basically drawing a sled with your own books from reading to reading, it's which is snowing. a lovely image in itself. Yeah, it was snowing, right. <laughs> it must have been one of those coffee table Chianti uh, bottle readings with the, with the espresso machine. Uh. No, it was a tour up the Ottawa Valley sea map uh, where they had never had any poet before uh, or writer yeah. at all. <laughs> So they did ask the best questions because they, they had no aesthetic pretension. So that was the occasion on which I was asked, is your hair really like that or do you get it done? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's very direct, you know. <laughs> That was the paragraph I was thinking about. And, well, go and ahead, I, go ahead. No, no, you, you mentioned it all. You mentioned those lovely two questions, and I won't, yeah. I won't uh, make you answer those questions now or ask you what answers you gave then, but I would like to uh, thank you for answering these questions and, and to read I'll and to tell come you over what I said. Yes, do. Oh, you, said, you answered, actually. Oh, yes. I said, if I was going to get it done, would I do this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you.